Let's begin our study here in Job chapter 34. I'll begin by reading verses 1 through 4, and uh, we'll get into our study. Job chapter 34, beginning at verse 1, reading to verse 4. Elihu further answered and said, Hear my words, you wise men. Give ear to me, you who have knowledge, for the ear tests words as the palate tastes food. Let us choose justice for ourselves. Let us know among ourselves what is good. So what we have here, and let me remind you of a few things as we enter into this week's uh, study of Job. Let me re remind you that a young man by the name of Elihu, who has been silently listening to Job as he has been speaking to three friends, has uh, finally gotten to the point where he can no longer contain himself. And so what he's doing now, and as we've seen, is he's beginning to give his opinion as to why Job is suffering. When we looked at chapter 32 in verses 2 and 3, uh, those verses gave us two reasons why he could no longer hold back from speaking. One is because he believed that Job justified himself rather than God. And two, because his three friends could not convince Job of Job's guilt. And so he began. He began to speak, and he began by saying, wisdom doesn't necessarily result from age. In other words, just because you men are older doesn't mean you have spoken from wisdom. And so after he made that point, he launched into his rebuke of both Job and his friends. So Elihu was speaking to them all. And he had rebuked his friends, Job's friends. Remember, uh, Aliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar. He, he had rebuked them because he was frustrated that none of them had convinced Job of his error. And, and he made it clear that that is what had provoked him to speak. He had said in chapter 32, verses 16 and 17, Must I wait now that they are silent, now that they stand there with no reply? I too will have my say. I too will tell what I know. And so he's jumped in because he's become frustrated. Job seems to be self-righteous. His friends can't convince him. So it's up to him now to speak. And so what did he do? Well, we saw this. He launched into a rebuke. He insisted that Job was speaking. Or rather, he insisted that he himself was speaking with honesty, sincerity, and uprightness of heart. That's how he began. In verse 3, he had said in Job 33, my words come from my upright heart. My lips utter pure or sincere knowledge. So Elihu, Elihu believed that Job was presenting himself as more righteous than God and that Job felt that he had been unfairly treated and had gotten close to accusing God of sin. So Elihu felt that Job had crossed the line and, and was in sin because he thought that Job had done that. In Job 33, 12 and 13, look, in this you are not righteous. I'll answer you, for God is greater than man. Why do you contend with him? For he does not give an accounting of any of his words. Job, why are you arguing with God? Do you think you're better than he? Do you think you're equal to him? And so he went on to speak, and he said, listen, God has ways that he speaks to man. We saw this last time in chapter 33. In verses 14 through 18, he said that man uh, receives from God by God's inward voice, that God can use dreams. In verses 19 through 22, he said that God speaks loudly by using pain when he chastises people. And then he also said in verses 23 through 26 that God speaks by living messengers. And he began to point to a need of a mediator. So what he was doing is he was reminding him that God does speak, but he was also saying, Job, you need to repent. And so as we look at these verses here in chapter 34 and prayerfully chapter 35, he uh, continues his speech. So it says in verse 1 of chapter 34 that Elihu further answered and said, Hear my words, you wise men. Give ear to me, you have knowledge. For the ear tests words as the palate tastes food. Let us choose justice for ourselves. Let us know among ourselves what is good. Now, he speaks of them in this way. He speaks in verse 2, you wise men. He also says in verse 10, you men of understanding. Well, he's calling them wise and understanding, but rebuking them at the same time. It's become quiet, apparently, and Elihu believes that he's driven Job to silence through his reasoning. 
And so what he wants is he wants justice and judgment to be pronounced. And that's why he begins in verses 2 and 3 and says, Hear my words, wise men, give ear to me, you who have knowledge. In other words, listen to what I have to say, because what I have to say is very, very important. He says in verse 3, the ear tests words as the palate tastes food. Uh, people listen to what is said in order to judge between what is wise or what is foolish. It's, it's like the way we use taste to distinguish between what is good food and what is bad food. So in normal life, our experiences that we have are used to make the best decisions. But in the spiritual life, God's word in his spirit results in spiritual wisdom. And that's one of the most important reasons that we take time to read our Bibles. The study of God's word equips us with wisdom as well as discernment. I really believe, and I'll take a moment just to say this, I really believe that, that the, the ne neglect of reading and studying the word of God is really showing itself in the church today. There are many, many who have been Christians for years and yet have still not grown in their maturity. If you go to, an uh, to a junior college in two years, you can get an associate's degree, right? If you go to a, a regular four-year college, in four years you can get a bachelor's degree. If you move on to get an advanced degree, a master's degree, depending on what you're studying, it takes at least another two years, sometimes three, right? You get your master's and then beyond that. If you want to go on to get a PhD, PhD, or whatever you might want to get, you can get a degree three to five years after that. You, you can spend years and years and years to, uh, to gather degrees. And, uh, you know, within six years or so, you can be referred to as a master. Well, when you think about it, uh, there, there are not a lot of six-year-old Christians today who would be qualified to be masters at the Word of God. Why is that? It's because we neglect it. It's because when I went to college, when we go to college, we spend our time reading books and writing papers and listening to lectures and, and then taking tests and all, and then we achieve a certain goal and they hand you a diploma. And you feel that you have, you have legitimately uh, performed a task that has gotten a reward but in, in the spiritual life a lot of people have been Christians not just four years or six years ten years you know ask yourself how long have you been a believer and just insert that knowledge I've been a Christian 50 years so you think about it's a long time to be a Christian am I a master and that's something that I challenge myself with do I know the Word of God have I mastered certain elements of it you know and many believers really haven't they've neglected God's Word They've been Christians for years, but don't understand. There's an interesting portion of Scripture in the book of Hebrews. Let me read it to you. It's found in Hebrews chapter 5, verses 12 to 14. It reads there, in fact, though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's word all over again. You need milk, not solid food. Anyone who lives on milk, being still an infant, is not acquainted with the teaching about righteousness. But solid food is for the mature, who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. We had four children, and uh, we have uh, a number of grandchildren now. And we've seen our children and now our grandchildren as they're growing from the milk stage to the meat stage and all. And when they were teeny, you know, a year old, even less, you know, even if you gave them, if you gave them any meat at all, it had to be chopped up really good. You didn't want to choke them. They would choke on the meat. So what was good for a baby was milk. But at a certain point, as they exercise uh, the things that God has given to them, they begin to develop maturity. And so the writer of Hebrews is simply saying to the, to the Hebrew Christians, by now you ought to be masters. By now you ought to know God's word. You ought to be partaking in what is called the meat of the word. But he says, unfortunately, you've remained infantile in your, in your spiritual growth. One of the things that we know about babies, uh, Marie and I having those four and seeing the little ones to this day, uh, they'll, they'll put pretty much anything in their mouth. Babies will. We have uh, my, my son Joseph and his wife Karina sold their house and, um, you know, moved in with us as they said, well, we'd be buying a house. And, and, uh, and we said, well, of course you can live with us. Um, and, uh, and on. they've been with us for a few months now. And so my two-year-old uh, granddaughter, my Olive, is, uh, you know, she's taken over. She's taken over the house. I mean, that's just the way it is. 
But the thing is, is that I, I will notice that sometimes she will bend down and find something on the rug and it looks pretty good to her and she eats it. She'll eat it. Babies put things in their mouths that they really ought not to do. And so that's what babies do. But you know, even, even Christians, when they're still immature, will watch something on TV or hear something on the radio or have a friend at work tell them stuff that isn't scripturally sound. And I've had babies who have basically, because they do, they lash out sometimes. I have a, a year-old baby, my, my Elena, and she's my son David's baby. And, and there have been times, and she, she's only 13 months old, but if she gets frustrated with me, she's, oh, I know she's left-handed because she <laughs> pops me with her left hand. You know, boom, you know, and she's seen Grandma do that. Um, <laughs> Babies, babies respond quickly, and, and sometimes when, when a baby in the Lord is, is, is corrected, they lash out too. And so what's going to help you? What's going to help us? Read the Word. Be in the Word of God. And if you want to know the meaning of a passage, then determine that you'll obey what you understand. And as you move on in life, you'll see that God begins to reveal himself to you, and you begin to mature and so we need to spend time reading the word. Why? Because in the spiritual life, maturity comes through hearing God's word. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You're grown, you grow in that fashion. And so immature believers can be seduced by false teachers. And that's why they need to be diligent to present themselves approved to God. Like Paul said in 2 Timothy 2.15, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And so he says the ear tests words as the palate tastes food. Verse four, let us choose justice for ourselves. Let us know among ourselves what is good. Let us discern what is right. Let us discern what is good. Let us seek truth and let us seek justice. Now, <laughs> I want you to note something. Uh, notice again in verse four how he says, let us choose justice for ourselves. Let us know among ourselves what is good. He is just as a young man inserted himself into equality with the elders. That's a bit of a little bit arrogant for this young man. This man has included himself in the circle of elders. He wasn't welcomed in. He included himself. Somebody said this, and I, I like this quote, pride loves to climb up, not as Zacchaeus to see Christ, but to be seen by others. And that's true. Pride likes to elevate not so that you draw closer to the Lord, but so that some who are below you might look up to you. And that's basically what this young man is doing. He's climbing up to be seen. He says in verse 5, For Job has said, I'm righteous, but God has taken away my justice. Should I lie concerning my right? My wound is incurable, though I am without transgression. What man is like Job who drinks scorn like water? who goes in company with the workers of iniquity and walks with wicked men. For he has said it profits a man nothing that he should delight in God. That's not true. Job has not said that. But what he's doing is he's setting forth a case against him. You, say, you see in, in verse 5, notice how he says, Job has said, I am righteous. In other words, I have right on my side. Well, in chapter 33, verse 9, Elihu had said that Job had said, I am pure without transgression. I'm innocent. There's no iniquity in me. So Elihu has misunderstood Job. Job was basically maintaining his, his integrity, but he was not claiming to be sinless. In Job 9, 17, he breaks me with a tempest. He multiplies my wounds without cause, he said. In Job 10, 7, you know that I am not wicked. There's none who can deliver out of your hand. In Job 16, 17, no violence is in my hands. My prayer is pure. He had simply said to the Lord and saying of the Lord, I, I, I don't see the reason why I'm being chastened in this way. He wasn't claiming to be perfectly righteous. He wasn't claiming to be perfect. He's simply saying that he doesn't understand what is taking place. He's, he says in verse 5, God has taken away my justice. Um, in, in chapter 27, verse 2, Job had said, as God lives, who has taken away my justice. In other words, he's saying that God has withheld from him the justice and judgment that he desired. 
Verse 6, should I, should I lie concerning my right? My wound is incurable, though I am without transgression. He's saying very clearly, my wound is incurable. Job is saying, although I'm right, I'm considered a liar. I have not opposed the will of God, and I can't confess to what I haven't done. When he says my wound, that word wound is interesting. One of the commentators that I use pointed out that the word wound literally is saying my arrow. My arrow is incurable. In other words, I've been, in, I've been injured. I've been injured without reason. Now remember in chapter 7, verse 20, he had said to the Lord, why have you set me as your target? So he's saying I'm going through this pain, and I feel that it's, it's, it's unfair. And he's saying, although I'm right, I've been considered a liar. I haven't opposed the will of God. I can't confess to what I haven't done. My wound is incurable. I've been injured, but that without, without reason. In verses 7 through 9, when he says, what man is like Job who drinks scorn like water? He's saying Job is, is, is using sarcasm because Job, he's saying, is filled with bitterness. The bitterness is what is flowing out of him. In verse 8, it says, who goes in company with workers of iniquity. In other words, the reason Job, that is, Job is using sarcasm and is mocking is because he has ungodly counselors. And that's something to think about, too, by the way. In the New Testament, in 1 Corinthians 15, 33, this is a, a, an important scripture to, to know. Uh, Paul said this. He said, be not deceived. Bad company ruins good morals. And what he is saying here is he is saying the reason Job is sarcastic and is mocking in the way he does is because he has bad company. And this bad company has influenced him in this way. He's receiving ungodly counsel. In verse 9, for he has said it profits a man nothing that he should delight in God. Job had never said that. He did say, I feel overwhelmed by God. In Job 9, 17 and 18, he would crush me with a storm and multiply my wounds for no reason. He would not let me regain my breath, but would overwhelm me with misery. I, I feel that I've been overwhelmed by God, but he's never said that it doesn't profit a man to delight in God. He's never said that. And so he's giving actually false accusations against Job. So it goes on in verse 10. Therefore, listen to me, you men of understanding. Far be it from God to do wickedness and from the Almighty to commit iniquity. For he repays man according to his work and makes man to find a reward according to his way. Surely God will never do wickedly, nor will the Almighty pervert justice. Who gave him charge over the earth or who appointed him over the whole world? If he should set his heart on it, if he should gather to himself his spirit and his breath, all flesh would perish together and man would return to dust. So Elihu was speaking to Job's friends, but there are others who are standing around that, he'd be that are more, than less, more or less listening to what he's saying. And so he says it. Well, what he's saying is true in verse 10. Far be it from God to do wickedness. In the Old Testament book of Deuteronomy 32, verse 4, it says, He is a rock. His work is perfect, for all his ways are judgment. A God of truth without iniquity, just and right is he. And so what he's saying here is right. Far be it from God to do wickedness. So Job, the afflictions that you have endured have actually been for your benefit. God wouldn't hurt you in order to harm you. God uses these things to help you. Now, in saying this, there is truth. Job 5.18, when Eliphaz was speaking, it says, for he bruises, but he binds up. He wounds, but his hands make whole. I'll look at that a little further when we get into the next chapter. But he's saying, God hasn't hurt you to harm you. In verses 11 and 12, he repays man according to his work. Your suffering is not undeserved. Now, this is a strong statement. He is simply saying, you're reaping what you've sown. You see, in Job chapter 4, verse 8, Eliphaz had said, even as I've seen those who plow iniquity and sow trouble reap the same. So he's saying what you're getting, you have done something to deserve. Now that's where he's wrong. He's saying you're, you're reaping what you sowed. If you were not evil, you wouldn't be suffering. 
Notice verse 12 says, Surely God will never do wickedly, nor will the Almighty pervert justice. If you were truly righteous, uh, well, even if you suffered now, in the next life you'll receive a proper reward. So don't be concerned about that. In verses 13 through 15, it says, Who gave him charge over the earth? Who appointed him over the whole world? God is absolutely sovereign. He didn't receive authority from a higher source. God is completely fair. He owes no favors to anyone. In verses 14 and 15, if he should set his heart on it, if he should gather to himself his spirit and his breath, all flesh would perish together. God is absolutely, absolutely the sovereign, and he sustains the entire universe. If you take notes, you might want to note this. Colossians chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. God sustains the entire universe. In Colossians 1, 16 and 17, for by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things were created by him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He's saying everything is held together by the Lord, but if he desired, he could destroy it all immediately. In verse 16, if you have understanding, hear this. Listen to the sound of my words. Should one who hates justice govern? Will you condemn him who is most just? As a man with wisdom and deep understanding, he's saying, listen to what I have to say. Notice verse 17. Should one who hates justice govern? <sighs> I'll be good. <laughs> the question really relates to, to God and the way God governs. And he's simply saying, if God is unrighteous, how could he be a just judge? Because a righteous judge will always judge righteously, but an unjust judge can often judge in an unjust fashion. So should one who hates justice govern? Should somebody govern who doesn't, doesn't value justice and righteousness? And so, in effect, he's saying, you can't say that God is unrighteous, because if he were, he wouldn't be just. And so that's the angle he's taking right now. So he says in verse 18, is it fitting to say to a king, You're, you are worthless, and to nobles, you are wicked? <sighs> <laughs> okay um, <laughs> it is not proper to call an earthly king or someone who is what is called a noble it is not proper to call him worthless even if he is worthless you might find this interesting the word worthless there literally says a son of Belial a son of Belial the word Belial is a word that is used to speak of Satan. And it, the word worthless is Belial. And so to say, even if this person is the son of Belial, even if this person is a demon, you know, inspired by and lives for, you don't, you don't dare to say those things about him. Now, he's actually using uh, his history, his context, and he's making it clear that those who rule should have respect, if not for themselves, for the office that they hold. So it's not proper for us to speak down concerning them. But in context, he is actually speaking to Job because he thinks that Job has, has accused the Lord of being unjust. And he's saying, listen, it's not proper or even prudent to call even an earthly ruler worthless. It seems to me, Job, that that's what you're saying concerning God. Now again, Job was not saying that. But he continues in verse 19, and he says, Yet he's not partial to princes, nor does he regard the rich more than the poor, for they are all the work of his hand. In a moment they die, in the middle of the night. The people are shaken and pass away. The mighty are taken away without a hand. He's saying God is impartial, and as an impartial judge, he doesn't favor anybody. 
In Deuteronomy 10, verse 17, it says, The Lord your God is the God of gods, the Lord of lords, the great, the mighty, the awesome God, who does not show partiality nor take a bribe. In Romans 2, verse 11, the same thought, there is no respect of persons with God. And so he's saying all people alike are treated fairly by God. And here's something interesting. The poor do not receive better treatment than the rich. Why is that? Because justice is blind, and justice is to be impartial. In Leviticus 19, if you take notes, you might want to note, Leviticus 19, 15, you shall do no unrighteousness in judgment. You shall not respect the person of the poor, nor honor the person of the mighty, but in righteousness shall you judge your neighbor. True justice really is blind. And that's why the, the uh, statue of Lady Justice with the scales is blindfolded, because justice is supposed to be blind. It's supposed to be uh, impartially meted out, not because I feel sorry for this person or I like this person. Justice should be equal. And so I'm not to take into consideration that person or that person. I love this person, can't stand that person, so I judge for this person. You know, the Bible says, no, justice is to be equal. And so God, in his justice, is also impartial. He says in verse 20, in, in a moment they die, in the middle of the night, the people are shaken, pass away, the mighty are taken away without a hand. The hour of death is not hastened for the poor, nor is it delayed for the rich, because both of them die. Verse 21, for his eyes are on the ways of man, and he sees all his steps. There is no darkness nor shadow of death where the workers of iniquity may hide themselves, for he need not further consider a man that he should go before God in judgment. He's fair. He's fair because he is all-knowing. Notice how he said his eyes are on the ways of man, and he sees all his steps. He sees everything. Nothing is hidden, even the things that they think are hidden, even the things that they do in darkness. Many people uh, prefer the darkness when they sin. We know that. Go to a party when you're in the world and walk into one of the rooms where some of the kids went in. Turn the light on and see how liked you are after doing that. I've done it before as a kid when I used to go to parties and things. You walk into the room, the room's dark. You open up the the light, open the door, turn on the light, and all the kids, turn the light off. Why is that? Why is that? Because what they were doing, they wanted to do in the dark. And a lot of crimes are committed in the dark. Why is that? Because the darkness covers it up. So we think that if nobody sees us, that we get away with it. And, and, and uh, this is simply not true. In Psalm 90, verse 8, you have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. There are sins that are open that people can see, but there are sins that are hidden that no one sees, and we think that nobody can see, but the scripture says, no, God sees everything, even those things you think you've hidden. In Hebrews 4.13, nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. So next time you think you're getting away with something, you look to the left, you look to the right, you look down, you better look up because he's still watching you as you do that. Remember that time when Moses was uh, there in Egypt as a young man? And the Bible speaks concerning Moses. The Bible tells us that he was learned in all the wisdom and knowledge of the, of the Egyptians. And when you read the scriptures concerning this man Moses, and, and uh, Moses is one of the heroic figures of all time, the deliverer of Israel and used by God to, to, uh, to bring the children of Israel out of the slavery of Egypt. And, and the scriptures tell us that Moses knew that he had been called by God to deliver the children of Israel. And when you begin to look at the story of uh, how this all took place when he was 40, how that he had seen uh, an Egyptian taskmaster who was um, abusing one of his, uh, his, uh, his uh, relatives according to the flesh, a fellow Israelite, the Bible says that Moses looked to the left and looked to the right, and then he promptly killed this Egyptian taskmaster. Now, let me say something, there, something very briefly to illustrate uh, why we don't just read through the Bible and, and not meditate. The taskmasters 
in Egypt, when you see the word taskmaster, the taskmaster in Egypt was the baddest, amongst the baddest of the bad in Egypt. They, they were the MMA fighters of their day, if you will. They were, they were bad, bad dudes. That's why they would be, be feared and obeyed. The Egyptian taskmaster was powerful, well-trained, and so the Jewish slaves w w would not rebel against him knowing that this one taskmaster could take out several of them if they caused a problem. So know that when you read the scripture next time when it says Moses looked to the left and the right and killed, promptly killed, the taskmaster. What does that tell me about Moses? That tells me he's bad. So when you, yeah, because he, he didn't, he, he was just seeing who's going who's gonna to see me kill this guy. Nobody, okay, it's over. Why do I know that? Well, he was learned in all the wisdom and knowledge of the Egyptians. Well, he was being raised to be the son of Pharaoh, as the son of Pharaoh. He could have taken the position of Pharaoh over that nation. What does that mean? That means that everything that the Egyptians had to offer to make him a warrior prince, he knew. And at the age of 40, this man would be equivalent to the bad, one of the baddest men that you'll ever see. That's what he was. He, 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 he knew that he was called to deliver the children of Israel. He knew that. So when he sees this taking place, I'm supposed to deliver him. Might as well start now. And the Bible says he kills him and buries him, covers it up, right? Moses looked to the left, the scripture says. He looked to the right. But commentators like to point out, but he didn't look up because he's being watched. And that's when he ended up 40 years in the wilderness learning what he's supposed to be. You know you're to be the deliverer, but you're not going to deliver with the arm of flesh. I will deliver my people. You will represent me. And that's how it works. It's not your physical abilities. It's God's supernatural gifting. And you need to understand that, he was saying to Moses, and that's a lesson we need to understand too. There's nothing I do that God doesn't see. So I should be aware of the fact that I am watched, that God is watching. He loves me, that is true, but God is watching. And we need to be aware of those things. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Well, in verse 23, he continues, he need not further consider a man that he should go before God in judgment. In other words, when it says he need not further consider a man, he doesn't review the case a second time in order to make sure he gave a fair judgment the first time. He doesn't have to do that. He already knows all the facts. In verse 24, he breaks in pieces mighty men without inquiry and sets others in their place. Therefore, he knows their works. He knows their, their works, meaning he knows their evil works. He overthrows them in the night. He does it quickly without warning, and they're crushed. He strikes them as wicked men in the open sight of others because they turned back from him and would not consider any of his ways. And so he sovereignly decides who's going to rule, he removes one, and he places another there. It says in verse 27, they turned back from him. Now, this is interesting. I'll speak about this and share a little bit about this in more detail. When it says, because they turned back from him and would not consider any of his ways, um, it, in the very early history of man, the awareness of God was much more abundant than it is in these latter days. In the earlier days, being closer to the original creation and the history of man being newer than it is now, uh, there was more of an awareness of God at that time. Uh, Paul spoke of that when he was writing to the Romans in chapter 2. In verse 14, he said, Indeed, when Gentiles who do not have the law do by nature things required by the law, they are a law for themselves, even though they don't have it. He's saying that even within them, intrinsically within man, you know that there are things that are right, and you know that there are things that are wrong. Those things come back from 
our history in how things were originally created and all, and that was part of the culture. And so he's referring to the reality of that, that man knows there's right, and man knows that they're wrong. But Alihu says that they have turned back from him. In other words, that means they wouldn't listen to him. Instead of progressing and walking towards the Lord, he said, they're moving away from him. And the further they drift, the less they desire and the less they, and the less they listen to what he has to say. The further you get away from God, the less interested you are in the things of God. In verse 28, is that for me? Oh, <laughs> that's oh, don't worry about it. I'll talk to him. It's okay. No problem at all. I see you getting embarrassed there. Can somebody put a camera on this man? <laughs> <laughs> I came to church tonight. Don't hurt me. Okay, I'm with you. <laughs> Verse 28. So that they caused the cry of the poor to come to him, for he hears the cry of the afflicted. We might want to mark that down. He hears the cry of the afflicted. God loves you. Elihu regards a wicked man as an oppressor, that he causes pain to those who are needy. But when the needy are in pain, God pays attention to their cry. Psalm 12, verse 5 says, The Lord replies, I have seen violence done to the helpless, and I have heard the groans of the poor. Now I will rise up to rescue them as they have longed for me to do. In verse 29, when he gives quietness, who then can make trouble? And when he hides his face, who then can see him? Whether it is against a nation or a man alone, that the hypocrite should not reign, lest the people be ensnared. If the peace experience that one has experiences from God, who can disturb God-given peace? That's, a, that's important to realize. Verse 29, again, you might want to remember this. When he gives quietness, who then can make trouble? Listen, when your mind is stayed on the Lord, there's a peace that you have that passes all understanding. There are times that people may not understand why you're not overreacting or reacting in the way that they think you ought to. Something has happened. How come you're so at peace? How come you're so calm? How come you're not freaking out? Why aren't you? Bad things are going on around you. It would be understandable if you began to, to be upset and worried and concerned. Well, when God gives you peace, who can disturb it? If God be for us, who can be against us? If the word of God is true, then why should I call God a liar? If God said, I'll keep you in perfect peace if your mind is stayed on me, then I'm going to keep my mind stayed on you. It's not that I ignore. It's that I understand who's greater than the storm. I may be in a storm, but I know who, who is the God of the storm. And so because I know that, again, that doesn't mean that I don't have my times. If it sounds that way, please forgive me. It doesn't mean that I'm always walking in total peace, you know, how can I? I'm married. But, you know, <laughs> I'm in peace. I'm at peace. <laughs> God keeps you strong, doesn't he? Have you discovered that? He does. And a lot of people freak out over things, and the believer doesn't. They think there's something wrong with us. They think, how come you don't care? Why, are you, why aren't you afraid? Why aren't you? Because my mind has stayed on him. I'm not being presumptuous. I'm trusting him. I do what is wise. And I'm not going to test him. But I'm walking with him. I'm obeying him. He's taking care of me. So when he gives quietness, who, who can make trouble? That's a great scripture. I love that scripture. It's a good one. See, the Lord does that work in us. He gives us that. So if the peace experience is from God, who can disturb the peace given from him. If God decides to hide himself, again, who can, who can discover him? If God should hide himself, well, the hypocrite will be displaced and the people will be freed. In verse 31, for has anyone said to God, I have borne chastening, I will offend no more. Teach me what I do not see. 
If I have done iniquity, I'll do no more. Should he repay it according to your terms just because you disavow it? He must choose, and not I. Therefore, speak what you know. And so, Job is as good as you are. In the end, you're, you're a sinner. And the pain you're enduring reveals that you're like all of us. You need help. But in verse 33, when he says, should you repay it according to your terms, just because you disavow it, have you been put in the place of God? And can you set the standard for him? And just because you say you haven't sinned, doesn't mean you're guiltless. And he said, finally, verse 33, therefore speak what you know. If this is what you think, then argue your point. Clarify your opinion. Men of understanding, verse 34, say to me, wise men who listen to me, Job speaks without knowledge. His words are without wisdom. Oh, that Job were tried to the utmost because his answers are like those of wicked men, for he adds rebellion to his sin, he claps his hand among us, hands among us, and multiplies his words against God. As a prosecuting attorney, he's drawing to his conclusion, and he's basically simply saying that the wise men will agree with me when I say Job deserves what he's got. He even deserves more. And if he's arguing about being innocent, he's only showing himself to be more guilty. And we'll move on into verse 1 of chapter 35. Reading to verse 3, Moreover, Elihu answered and said, Do you think this is right? Do you say my righteousness is more than God's? For you say, what advantage will it be to you? What profit shall I have um, more than if I had sinned? So again, he's placing words in Job's mouth. He, he says in verses 2 and 3, Do you say my righteousness is more than God's? Job had never claimed to be more righteous than God. He did say that he was being treated unfairly. And what he clearly had said is, um, it's the unbelievers who see no profit in serving God. Job didn't say there was no, no profit in it. He said unbelievers see no profit in serving him. Remember in chapter 21, verse 15, who is the Almighty that we should serve him? What would we gain by praying to him? That was in the mouth of unbelievers. It's the unbelievers who refuse to worship God because to them worship has no value. In Psalm 10, verse 4, in his pride, the wicked doesn't seek him. In all his thoughts, there's no room for God. See, there are a lot of people even in our day who will say, what's the point? Why should I follow God? What do I have to gain by doing that? What value is there? What profit is there if I pray? What profit is there if I yield to him? And they, they don't believe that they need to do that because they don't see it as actually being valuable to them. So he goes on in verse 4 and he says, I will answer you and your companions with you. Look to the heavens and see. Behold the clouds. They're higher than you. If you sin, what do you accomplish against him? Or if your transgressions are multiplied, what do you do to him? If you're righteous, what do you give him? Or what does he receive from your hand? Your wickedness affects a man such as you, and your righteousness, a son of man. And so, He's beginning to deal with the reasonings of, of Eliphaz, Zophar, and Bildad. And he's speaking concerning the heavens. Notice in verse 5. And he says, look to the heavens. Behold, the clouds are higher than you. As a man, you're lower than the material sky and heavens, and the God who created them is far above you. So you can't affect him in any way. He says in verse 6, he goes, if you sin, what do you accomplish against him? Or if your transgressions are multiplied, what do you do? To him, uh, our sins don't injure him, and our sins don't diminish his power. In verse 7, if you're righteous, would you give to him? In other words, your righteousness doesn't enhance him either. In Psalm 16, verse 2, it's a beautiful psalm where it says, I said to the Lord, you are my Lord. Apart from you, I have no good thing. In verse 7, what does he receive from you? Your hand, since all things already belong to him. Like it says in Psalm 24, verse 1, the earth is the Lord's, everything in it, the world, and all who live in it. In other words, we can only give him what he has already given to us. It actually only always belongs first to him. 
He says, your wickedness, in verse 8, affects a man such as you. Well, you can't affect God. You can only affect man. Our sins can harm us, but our sins don't harm God. In verse 9, he says, because the multitude of oppressions, because of the multitude of oppressions, they cry out, they cry out for help because of the arm of the mighty. Those who are injured by the rich and mighty cry out in pain because of oppression. They cry out in sorrow, they cry out in pain, but often don't cry out to God for help. And this verse here that I'm gonna look at right now, I might come back to it next week as, and give you a few more thoughts. But this verse, if you underscore scripture, to me it's one of, one of the verses that God gave to me a long time ago, and I'll share just a couple thoughts as we look at it. Notice verse 10, no one says, where is God my maker who gives songs in the night? What a, what a poetic way of putting it. No one says, where is God my maker who gives songs in the night? Night in scripture very often speaks of something obviously that is dark, but it can also speak of sorrow. At the seasons of, of the soul, sometimes when there's pain, they can be called uh, times of the night in my life. I have suffered through times of, of darkness, of, 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 of the night. Elihu is saying that God can give joy and bring comfort even in your darkest hours. God can inspire songs of praise from us even in our darkest times. And God can turn our times of mourning into songs of joy. I think of Paul and Silas incarcerated in a jail cell in the city of Philippi. They were on an evangelistic mission and they had come to this city, Philippi, and as they were there, a demonized girl had been following around and had actually become promoter, promoting them. These, you know, these are the men from God and all. And, and the Bible tells us that, that Paul got very frustrated with this, this young girl and finally turned around and said, in the name of Jesus Christ, come out of her and delivered her from her, her demon possession. Well, she was a slave and she was owned by certain masters who had made their living off of her because she had a, a spirit that was used for uh, prediction and prophesying. And so the people around there in Philippi knew of this young woman, would come to her, would ask her to give a prophetic word for them, and she would give words, and they would pay the masters, and now, now it's over. Now their, their means of, of uh, financial security have been, have been lost to them because Paul had kicked the demon out of this young woman. And, and, and they did not like it. And so what they did is they took him and they dragged Paul and, and they took Silas and, and they, they brought him before the judge, before the magistrate. And they began to charge them. And they said, these, these men are teaching customs that break our laws. And, and after they did that, they were unjustly beaten. The Bible tells us that they were beaten with rods and that many stripes were laid upon them. And then they imprisoned them. So when you think about the beaten with rods, that's something we don't, I don't understand. Perhaps some in this room may. I, I don't understand it. It's, it's like a whip. And, and to be beaten with that rod, it, 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 is, it, it would tear your flesh. It was a horrible, horrible, painful way to be beaten. And that's what happened to them. And their, their, their backs were bloody wounds. Then they took them and they, they put them in stocks and they had them in the most uncomfortable position as they were in there. And, and what's interesting as they're waiting in, in, in this cell, the Bible tells us this in Acts 16, 25. It says, now toward midnight, Paul and Silas praying were singing praises to God. And the prisoners were listening to them. I've been reading this, this my Bible for 50 years and I still remember the first time I read Acts chapter 16 and verse 25, I still remember thinking, how was that possible? To be beaten, unjustly imprisoned and beaten, to be put in stocks, and then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, guys, verse 25 in Acts 16, and they were singing praises to God in midnight. Where is he who gives songs in the night? Where is he? Where are our eyes? 
What are we looking at? What are we looking at? Either I can look at the pain or I can receive the promise. Either I can either I can meditate on what is hurting or I look beyond what is hurting, the affliction, and I know that, and this may sound, this probably does sound simplistic, but it's true. Either I can concentrate on what is hurting me, or I can ask God to teach me through that pain a lesson that will help me understand and become a better Christian. I remember an old illustration of a, of a man who had been placed in a, a jail cell and he had been chained to it and, and at first he was trying to pull off the wall. He was, and then he, he couldn't, he couldn't. And, and the writer said, and then this man contorted his body as much as he could and he kissed the chains and I didn't understand. First time I read that, I was a young believer. I didn't understand that. Kiss the chains. Why would you do that? Well, the illustration was intended to communicate to us that he accepted where he was because he knew that this was a place God was going to meet him in a special way. And I have to tell you, there are things you've gone through and I've gone through that had I written out the script for my life would not have included those things would not have included those things. It would not have included those pains. It would not have included those tears. It would not have included that sorrow. It would not have included the disappointment. It would not have included everything that I went through. But now I look back and I see those were places where God met me in a very special way that I, I would not have experienced. No, I'm not saying go out and beat yourself with a board and meet God. I'm not saying that. <laughs> what I'm saying is sometimes people don't ask, where is God who gives songs in the night? Where is God who can teach me to dance in the dark? Where is he? Because we get focused on our pain and we forget that there is one who understands, who doesn't leave us, who doesn't forsake us, who understands. He has a bottle that keeps my tears in it. He hasn't forgotten. And so in this, this statement, this is a statement that has spoken to my heart for many years. No one says, where is God, my maker, who gives songs in the night? That, that, that has spoken to me for the longest time because God is the one who shows up in our darkest moments. We can look up with tears, but we can see God and the mourning of our heart can become songs of joy. In verse 11, who teaches us more than the beasts of the earth, makes us wiser than the birds of heaven. There they cry out, but he doesn't answer because of the pride of evil men. Surely God will not listen to empty talk, nor will the Almighty regard it. Although you say you do not see him, yet justice is before him, and you must wait for him. And now, because he has not punished in his anger, nor taken much notice of folly. Therefore, Job opens his mouth in vain. He multiplies words without knowledge. So in verse 11, he reminds us that we are more precious to him than the beasts of the field and the birds of the air, something that Jesus taught us in Matthew chapter 6. And he had said, look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them, and are you not of more value than they? He says in verses 12 through 14, there they cry out, but he doesn't answer because of the pride of evil men. They cry out and don't receive answers because of their sin. They're filled with pride. Like it says in Isaiah 59, 1 and 2, surely the arm of the Lord is not too short to save, nor his ear too dull to hear, but your iniquities have separated you from your God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. So they don't cry out for the help that comes from God alone because they don't trust him and have no faith in him. And so finally in verses 15 and 16, because he hasn't punished, his anger hasn't been revealed. He's simply saying this. He's saying, Job, to be honest with you, you haven't suffered enough. You haven't learned these basic things that I've just revealed. 
Because if you had learned these things, you wouldn't be saying the things that you've been saying. So this young man has taken it upon himself to correct a man who God spoke of and said he is the most righteous man on the face of the earth. There are things that he said that are very true and timely, but he's misjudging and judging Job for something Job didn't do. And we'll see that as we continue on in this book. And Father, you are our maker and you are the one who gives, gives to us songs in the night. Lord, I ask that we would just even now just cast our burdens on you. Some have brought them here. Some are watching online and they're carrying a pain that only you can understand. And so even before we close, we would lift those things to you and we would pray, Father, for your help. Let us not be prideful. Let us not try and deliver ourselves. Let us trust you to be the one who delivers. And we lift these things to you. You know our hearts. And you know the things that we need that only you can supply. And so we, we lift these things to you. And we ask that you would, you would meet us. And even as our eyes are closed, our heads are bowed, there may be some right now who need to get right with the Lord. And before I close, whether you're online or whether you're in this room, before I close, I'd like to give a, a word of prayer on your behalf. And so if you need prayer to get right with him right now, if you need, need him to, to be with you in a special way, whatever, would you raise your hand? Let me pray for you before I close. Father, you see these hands. You know exactly what is going on in each person who's raised in their hand right now. You know it's the need. Lord, thank you that you're aware. We simply would come to you now and ask that you would have your way, that you would do your work in them. Lord, our hearts are open to you. We ask that you would just right now just move within and have your way in us. We trust you. We're looking to you. And we ask that you would just be with us now, Lord. And we give you praise for these things. And thanks, Lord. And we bless you. Thank you. You can put your hands down. And Jesus, please keep moving in us. In your name. Amen.